Hey, so we are back here for our next session with Lila. She is a UX designer at Hano and uh, product in the product design company. So Hano is a product design company. And uh, she will talk about cultivating a remote culture. And it's interesting because Jeff was talking a lot about culture and trust. So she will kind of like go ahead and continue this conversation uh, about culture. So it's going to be very interesting there because it's one of the main struggle we see people talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and um, bring Lila to the screen and unmute you. Hi, Lila. How are Hi, you? Hi, everyone. Good, good, good. Um, nice to see you. Um, nice to see you. And uh, I'm going to just tell people again, ask you a question in the Q&A se session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question in the last 10 minutes. I'm making my best I can to do as many questions as possible, but it's not always possible to answer everything. So if you upvote them, the most popular are really the one who, that we are asking. Sometimes it's three, four. So we're going to do our best. So uh, I'm going to hide myself now and give you the stage and you can uh, start talking about Great. culture. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for having me. I was um, part of the first edition of Out of Office last year and really met some, some great speakers afterwards that I connected with. So um, it's really exciting to be here. I'll be talking about remote work culture and how to cultivate it. I think it's something that you can keep growing. And, um, but first of all, I'm just going to introduce myself quickly. My name is Lila. You can find me on Twitter with this Twitter handle, and you can also find Hano, which is a company I work with. And uh, yeah, feel free to tweet us during the talk if you want to. Um, so, as Daphne mentioned, I work at Hano, which is a digital design, um, a digital product design team, and uh, we're helping a lot of businesses grow and understand the digital economy. And um, we're a team of ten currently. Uh, we're a fully remote team, as you can see uh, where people are based. This is constantly changing, by the way. I mean, usually uh, I update this, but you know, we're we're constantly on the move. And uh, we're, so we're this distributed team and we come online on the internet to work together. And we often say the internet is our home um, because it's really where, where we collaborate all the time. But um, the thing about us being remote, the, the reason we're remote is because we really believe that people should live a lifestyle that makes them happy. And we believe that you know, if people are happier in their personal life, that's going to uh, be felt in the team and it's going to make it better to work together as well. Um, so it's a, it's a core part of, of Hano's DNA, if you want to put it that way. Um, but I often get asked the question if Hano is an agency, and I sometimes struggle to answer that question because Hano does provide a lot of the same or similar services that a traditional agency would serve. Um, but we are set up in a completely different way. So first of all, we are fully remote. Um, mainly uh, based in Europe and Southeast Asia, but you know, at the moment we also have people on the West Coast of the US. Uh, we are also a team that is entirely self-managed. So we're a flat team, we don't have any hierarchies and we make decisions collectively. Um, we're very, very transparent as well. So both internally, for example, we share our salaries, uh, but we're also transparent with our clients. We really show them every part of the process and what we're doing there. They can at any time see what we're discussing about the project, whether it's on Slack or in, in our Hangouts. And um, we're also transparent with people who follow what we read. So we write a lot of blog posts and uh, we share also you know, things that we haven't been successful at as well as our successes. And finally, I think we're very passionate about uh, doing social good. So we're, we've been very purpose driven and especially since two years ago, we decided to become a social business and try to help out and work with companies and um, people who are really socially motivated. So these are um, some of the services that we provide. We're mainly a user experience uh, design uh, team, uh, but you know, that's broken into a lot of different parts, whether it's research or prototyping. Uh, we do a lot of web development. We also give workshops. Um, and we've worked with a lot of different kinds of organizations from corporates to nonprofits to startups. Um, and more and more, we're trying to help, uh, as I mentioned before, um, people who work in social good, especially startups who really like to launch them. So for example, we have Ava here on the right. Um, this is a startup in, based in San Francisco and they've created an app 
that um, helps people who are hard of hearing and deaf to, to follow conversations. Uh, it's a great app. I'd recommend you to check it out. Um, but today, yeah, I'm here to talk about remote work culture. Um, and in a way, it's very similar to, to a normal work culture, but it demands just as much effort, if not more, to, to grow it. Um, so yeah, Daphne, I guess you can share my whole screen here from now on because I'm going to share a little bit more um, of slides with some smaller text. So uh, I guess you guys all know that culture is fundamental to any kind of work. And um, I still like to define it and try to understand what it is. As Jeff mentioned before in his talk, it's something very abstract, um, but at the same time, um, you could also see it as a reflection of the values and the beliefs that people have. And in an organization that would be reflected, especially by how the leaders, uh, what the leaders values are and how they transmit those to other people, but not just the leaders, it's, it's generally something that's transmitted in the whole organization. Um, and when we look at values, uh, we'll see that these values often, values often represent what is important in our lives and they are often met on our unmet needs. So these needs are kind of what drive our aspirations and our intentions. Um, and they really help us to live authentically and connect with others, especially if we have shared values with other people. So in a way you can see values as, you know, when they're shared with people, they can kind of unite us and uh, they can be considered as more universal, um, especially in an organization. And just to go a little bit more into that, I guess values reflect how you view yourself as a person, but also, again, look at this as an organization. Uh, you know, who is this organization? What matters to this organization, to your team? Um, what, what drives your decision? So, you know, we think about all these examples of values such as trust or transparency or respect. Um, usually these are things that are very important to the life of an organization and that have to be represented throughout the decisions that they make. Um, so if we look at values as this kind of foundation, um, we can see it that it's some, the values keep us on track and they'll continue to guide us towards our vision and our mission. So we can look at the vision as the future that the organization wants to create for itself. Um, and in a way it's a destination that you want to reach. And this destination might continue to change and it's like this North Star um, that guides you, but you know, um, this isn't always a fixed destination and the mission can be seen as things that you have to do uh, the actions that will get you to your destination. Um, and so I mentioned before that culture also includes beliefs um, and we can look at beliefs as assumptions that have been made based on our past experiences. So they're, they're very uh, contextual, whereas, you know, values were more, are usually more universal. Um, the thing is with beliefs is that if we are using beliefs to make decisions, uh, we're assuming that things that happened in the past and that were valid back then will also be valid in the present and in the future. And the only maybe problem of making, of making decisions solely based on beliefs is that in, in, in today's world, when things are changing, faster than ever um, is not using information from the past to drive decisions about the future is not always ideal. So as an organization or as a group of people, we have to be careful of how much we rely on beliefs to drive our decisions. So if I come back to culture, as I said before, um, it's, this, it's, it's reflecting our shared values and beliefs, this kind of common identity that we can have. And it often begins uh, by, by getting the values and beliefs shared from, from people, especially who are in a leadership role or people who founded the company, um, the legacy of past leaders. And of course, leadership transforms itself. And so in that way, so do the, you know, so do the people who are in this organization and the culture itself will continue to transform itself. But on a more tangible level, if you want to see what represents culture, we can break it down into the words the actions and the behaviors that are reflected not only by the current leaders and the, the past leaders, but also by the people who are currently um, part of that organization. So I hope that was a bit useful. Um, I imagine most of you know what culture is anyway, but I always 
appreciate kind of breaking things down and, and going into the nitty gritty of, of what something is. Um, and I also want to show why culture is important. Um, so here are just a few benefits uh, that help an organization when it comes to culture. It, it actually helps you define who you are as an organization. That is going to attract more people to want to work with you and for you. Um, and then when you have a more defined culture and it's a positive one and it, it creates a, a better work environment for everyone, um, that's also super beneficial. And it also continues to guide you towards your destination. So as I mentioned before, you have like a general business um, goal um, that will continue to change. Um, but yeah, these are the benefits of culture. And so you may be asking yourself now, how do I create a work a culture for a remote team? Um, and the answer to that is not simple, but in a way it is because in fact, you can't really create a culture just from scratch. So this is, I find a great um, quote from Jason Fried from the author of Rework. Um, you don't create culture, culture happens. And it's a byproduct of consistent behavior. And I think it's really important for people to know that you can't just magically expect a culture to be shared and to, for people to behave in a certain way just because you've decided that something's a culture and that, you, um, that you've put even, you know, created some kind of manifest on the wall and everybody should do that. But there is, although you can't create culture, you can somehow plan it. So there is an element of planning to it. You can have purposeful actions that will help to shape the culture. Um, especially in your day-to-day -day interactions. So as long as you're consistent with those, um, that will continue to build and maintain your culture. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Hano's culture now. Uh, the main three aspects to our culture, I would say are trust, transparency, and empathy. And I'm just going to go through them one by one so you can get a better understanding of what I mean by that. So. Jeff also talked before about trust, and this is a major, major aspect of a lot of remote cultures. Um, it's actually, the trust is usually the biggest blocker for teams who want to try going remote, um, or teams who have, who have already tried going remote and decide that it doesn't work out for them. I guess from, from many people's point of view, whether it's managers or also colleagues between each other, if there's a lack of trust, you're going to create a work environment where people are not uh, not motivated um, and might be even stressed out by this lack of trust. So in order to be um, to have a successful uh, remote culture, establishing that trust is super, super important. And I always think it's the first thing that remote teams have to have to take into consideration to tackle a lot of the problems that may come from collaboration and communication. So to build trust, at least in HANO, these are some things that we do uh, for us to uh, be more reliable. Um, so first of all, we share everything we do. We're constantly updating the team on what we're working on. Even you know, if we're doing things that don't affect other people, we're just updating them and saying, this is what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes we'll share a couple of screenshots just to kind of keep people in the loop. We also share, for example, if we're going to take a break or if we're online or offline, it just helps to make people feel like they can trust you. Um, we also, you know, we, we're not time tracking anybody on the team. What we look at the most is um, if people can deliver on the commitments that they have made, what are the outcomes of the work that they've been doing? And also a very important aspect to be reliable is um, we try to regularly meet face to face. So whether that's online in video calls or in real life, um, these interactions are super important. Um, Especially in video calls, we always use a webcam. Uh, we're always trying to recreate that, that kind of interaction you would have if you would have the person in front of you. And you know, we are humans at the end of the day and it really helps um, to build trust that way and know who you're talking to. The other aspect, uh, transparency, is really necessary. It's a necessary part of trust, actually. Um, as I said before, we share everything we do and not just within our team, but also with our clients, because you have to remember that as a remote team, you also need your clients to be able to trust you. So one thing we always say at Hano is that we have to over communicate uh, what we do. Uh, we shouldn't be working in silos. Again, if we are, even if we're on a solo project, we try to ping each other and make sure that we're supported and we know what other people are doing. We often share um, our wins. So for example, we have a, 
a channel in Slack which is just dedicated to um, things that people want to announce that have been fairly successful, uh, such as, I don't know, announcing like a pitch that we just won, or maybe there's like even a personal win, you know, or even me being invited to the out of office talk, that was a win, so I shared that. But we also share um, our failures. Uh, so maybe, you know, we haven't been able to meet a deadline. We might have, you know, we might have to be very transparent about that. Um, and we've also written blog articles about things that haven't worked out at Hano, and we share that with, with the public. And when it comes to decision making, we have a process called the, the AP, which stands for advisory process. And we use a tool called Lumio. So you have the link there, lumio.org, uh, which is really, really useful for people who want to make decisions collectively. So it doesn't mean that if somebody, so basically you make a proposal in Lumio and we ask the people to, to give their agreement but it doesn't mean that if people abstain or disagree with the proposal it doesn't mean that the proposal doesn't go through it just means that those people who abstained or disagreed uh will need to have a conversation with the person who made the proposal so that they can kind of see if they can reach some kind of um compromise and um finally we have the aspect of empathy um so when it comes to empathy you know at hano it's it's easy i think in any virtual team to to kind of forget that there's people at the other end of the other end of the internet or the other the other side of where you are, and we we often think people just have to execute tasks, and then it, it kind of create this really dry environment where people just send over what they did and say, yeah, okay, I finished this and um, I'm done and that's it. Whereas we really try to recognize our team members as human beings, and we want them to share not only what they're doing but also how they're feeling. And ideally, we want people to be themselves and bring their whole selves to work or as much as they want of themselves to work. So in order to do that, we really want people to be authentic. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. We have, for example, daily check-ins, um, which are, so basically we have a bot in Slack, which checks in with every person uh, twice a day and asks them how they're feeling on a scale of one to five. Um, and by sharing, how they're feeling and why they're feeling that way, that gets announced to the rest of the team. And everybody can kind of check everybody else's moods. And we also have these moods and feelings tracked. So we get like a, a weekly digest. At the end of the week, we can see how people are feeling. Um, and it's been super useful for us also because as a remote team, you can feel very isolated sometimes. And you, you're, if nobody asks you how you're feeling, you might not even share it. So it's good to have this bot that automatically is asking you. We also do regular um, weekly hangouts uh, that last about 45 minutes to an hour and people can do like a share and tell. Uh, we also have little icebreaker exercises. So they're quite fun, but sometimes we also use the hangouts to discuss something uh, that's pretty important and urgent. Um, and then we have buddy calls, which are basically calls where you are paired with somebody else in your team. So every week you're paired to somebody else and it's up to you guys. You can have one call or two calls a week um, just to talk about non-work related things. So because, because we're remote, we're missing those kind of water cooler conversations and it's hard to be spontaneous. So we kind of uh, force people to, to be more spontaneous and we use this bot called Donut. Uh, so it's D-O-N-U-T dot I-O, uh, which automatically pairs people in Slack. And that's quite useful. And we also organize team retreats twice a year where we meet face to face. I mean, those are super, super valuable to really get to know each other. Um, we used to do retreats where we would talk about the company a lot and um, focus on what we wanted to improve. Um, but lately, we've the last two retreats we did, we decided to just use them as time to hang out or do some activities together. So like, for example, last time we went to Sri Lanka a couple of uh, months ago and we did just yoga and surfing and that really brought us together also in a maybe more um, interconnection way I don't want to make it sound too spiritual it wasn't super spiritual at all but it was a great way to do things together and um, get connected uh, we also gave each other feedback so I'll go into that a little bit later and again we want people to share personal stories what they're doing you know if they're moving house if they've I don't know, they're frustrated by some kind of company or brand that's frustrated them with something, whatever it is, or some, something else. We want people to be really authentic um, online. Um, so yeah, how do we maintain culture? Um, 
it's okay to have one, but then once you have it and you've kind of defined what your values are and, and what your vision is, it's, it's the next step is then maintaining it all the time. Um, and one thing we need to remember is that culture is inevitably going to change. Uh, it's something that's organic, but what we can do is encourage the behaviors and attitudes that are benefiting our culture and, you know, discourage or point out, bring to surface the problems when people are not acting in a way that's aligned with our values and beliefs, we point that out. So the important thing is to be a role model and lead by example, you know, be a role model for the culture that you want to create and, and show that consistently. Again, consistency is quite a big, a big thing. Um, so another thing that you can do to maintain culture and especially to help other people who are new to your team to, to understand your culture is to create a handbook. So this can be some kind of manual uh, where you provide all this information, instructions about how your company is organized. Um, so we have, for example, the Hano playbook. Well, now we have playbooks because we're creating more and more. Um, so I encourage you to check these out. And um, these are um, playbooks that we share publicly and also with ourselves and new, new members of our team um, so that they can understand how we work, how we operate, uh, what, you know, how we do certain things, whether it's taking holidays, whether it's uh, pitching to a client, um, and it also is useful to share our purpose uh, with them. If you are also familiar with the buffer uh, culture deck, you can find it on SlideShare. Um, this is another example of how other people have done it. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a website. We've done it like that. Um, buffer also has a SlideShare, which they share. And I love that they have like version 0.6 uh, and it's showing that, you know, it's constantly evolving. Um, IDEO has their little book of IDEO, uh, which is absolutely great. I've never seen one uh, in real life, but I, I love how they say in the beginning, I think they say something, it's a reflection of where we've been, uh, where we're going and the values that drive our journey. Um, so yeah, that's one, one way of maintaining it. We also have created a, a manifesto, which is actually called a Hananfesto. And that's again, it's a kind of declaration of our intentions. It's much simpler. Um, and we've made it that way as many manifestos to, to make it simple and easy to remember. There are just five points. We do have a place where we kind of describe these in more detail. Um, I'm not going to go through them now, but basically I would recommend if anybody's doing a manifesto to keep it simple. You know, you want people in your organization to remember what their manifesto is. Um, <clears throat> we've also created on our website a purpose page where we share what our mission is and what we believe in. Um, and again, all these things have been really useful, not only to share with the team publicly, but it's also brought us in a lot of work. A lot of people have contacted us because they found the playbook super interesting and valuable. So um, just before I finish, I want you to go through a little, a uh, couple of the exercises and workshops that we've done both internally and with other teams. So we have started uh, coaching other teams to learn how to work remotely. Um, and the, the workshops that we're giving, well, I'll go into that in a, in a little bit more detail, but we do touch on culture. And the thing about culture though that I want to emphasize is that you know, we're very aware that we can't teach culture, but at least we can give people some kind of framework and the guidelines to get them started on thinking about how they can do this culture uh, for themselves and create a, you know, a more positive work environment. So here's just a, a screenshot of, of what it looks like to do one of these workshops. Um, we use a lot of tools. We have Slack open, we have Mural, which is an online whiteboard uh, tool, and we have Zoom, which is a video conference tool. And I've had up to 24 people at the same time. So this is like a live interactive workshop. And the way we do them is we start talking about culture first. And then we also touch on communication and collaboration. And it's funny to see how a lot of people who, who sign up for these or who are interested in, in learning how to work better remotely ask me for, um, or they sign up because they say, we, you know, they want to know the tools and the processes. And that's very important. I'm not saying they're not. But one thing that I always tell them is tools are great, but, you know, tools are going to keep changing. If you look at the pace of 
how technology is changing all the time. Um, you know, one day you're going to be using Skype, another day you're gonna be using Zoom. Um, so tools are great, but culture, culture is slower to change and more importantly, culture is more fundamental to have at the beginning. So that's um, something we always bring up. And um, if you look at um, this, this canvas here, this is a team canvas. Um, again, I, you can go and check it out at, uh, I think it's theteamcanvas.com. We use this as well. Uh, we've used this internally. I've used this with other groups of people and with, with students as well who create um, their own teams for a project. It's, it's very familiar. It's very similar to the business model canvas for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, and it's very helpful to get people in a team aligned on what their goals and, and what their roles should be and you know how to define their purpose. Um, and here's another exercise that I've created um, that I've also shared publicly in a blog post recently, but you know, this is something we did for our team specifically, and it's a template we did on mural to help each other give each other feedback. And what you have on the top row is um, we, we have the space where we created our own guidelines for how to give effective feedback. And we have other tips on how to give and receive feedback. And then the bottom row is actually a space where as a group, we can start posting these like virtual sticky notes um, to each other and letting each other know what are the kind of behaviors that are helping us be better teammates or work better together. And what are the kind of behaviors or attitudes that we would like to discourage in these people and help them change. Um, so the way we do this is, you know, we'll be on a call and we'll all be talking together um, and one by one people will be sharing their feedback to others. And, and the reason we do this openly is because again, transparency is a huge part of our culture and we want everybody to, to be aware of how others are growing and developing themselves and and you know, also giving an opportunity to other people to, to maybe um, learn from others. Um, so this isn't an evaluation process. This isn't like some kind of yearly review. So far, we've only done this once. We did this in January. But what I can say is that personally, I thought it was really helpful, first of all, to, to learn. On the personal side, I felt, okay, it's great to know that these kind of behaviors that I have are helpful for my team. Others are less helpful. But I really think that after this, that th this helped us connect us a lot more on a more personal level. And I remember that the, f the weeks and the days following this feedback process, um, I felt much, much more connected to my team as, as even friends, but as human beings. And I, I remember there was a really good vibe on Slack. So, you know, Slack, like I said, internet is our home. Slack is our office. It was kind of like you could, you could sense of the conversations going on. Um, between us, even in our calls, were, were more bubbly, were, had more warmth and attachment to it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now, but um, just to let you know a couple of tips if you're planning on defining your remote culture for your, for your remote team, um, whether you're semi-remote or fully remote, I think you, know, you have to start out with identifying what your values and your beliefs are, and you know, what's, the what's, what's the vision that you have for yourself, which future do you see for your organization, um, and then once you have those, uh, it's not, it's not just about making some manifest. I mean, that's a plus, but it's about being consistent with your behavior, leading by example. And then remember to meet regularly, you know, those, those video calls are super important, especially with the, with, with the webcam, but also, you know, team, team retreats, um, are very, very valuable moments and moments that you won't forget. You know, this is really where you bond with people. Um, also, you can share your intentions with, within yourselves, whether it's a playbook or something like that. It's always useful to have it somewhere. Also, so you, if you onboard more people, they can understand uh, the story behind uh, what your values and your culture is. And most importantly, I guess, remember that culture is a journey and that you have to let it evolve and, and grow with you. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you very much. Um, Daphne, I guess you can show me again <laughs> if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah, you're back, you're back here now. Um, you can also stop uh, uh, sharing you. your screen so you can see us. Basically, she cannot see us when she has the, 
a presentation ready. It was really nice to listen to your presentation. I think it was very helpful. Many people are uh, commenting right now how it's been valuable information, all different tools that you guys use. It's very interesting, very valuable. So thank you so much for coming in today and sharing that knowledge. It's really nice. Um, before we uh, go ahead, let's go ahead and uh, go uh, answer some questions from uh, our audience. So I have one question here from Noel. It is, uh, what tools and workflows do you use to bring clients into the creative process remotely? So brainstorming, mm -hmm. defining personas, constructive feedback rounds, et cetera. Okay, so the first thing we do with our clients even before they become our clients is we make them read our playbook. So it's been super valuable for us to have, as I said, to onboard people, whether it's our team, but also to onboard clients. We make them read our playbook so that we're sure that they understand how we work. And then after that, before, so we work in sprints, which are usually um, there are five day sprints, but we might have like back to back sprints that might, you know, so a project might last up to two months or even more. Um, but what's important, I think, to onboard the, the, the client, we always have like a kickoff uh, call with them. We make sure that, you know, if they have any questions, we can answer them and we introduce them to all the tools that we're going to use. So usually what we do is we create a new Slack team. We don't bring them into the Hano Slack. Uh, for many reasons, but we find it quite easy to create a new Slack team. We have specific channels in the Slack team that we always have is um, we'll have like a check in and check out channel, which we call Chico. So that's a channel where people can say I'm online starting from this time and now I'm going to go offline and I'm going to be back again in two hours. Um, that helps the client know when we're online. And again, it builds trust and it shows that we're reliable and we're going to commit to what we said. Um, we also have a channel well then it depends if we're doing design strategy whatever it is that we're doing with them we have dedicated channels for that and then we have a channel for daily updates so we have this other thing called uh, the ppp which stands for um plans prog uh, sorry progress plans and problems and this is generally shown in a g doc uh, it's a one pager it's not a it's not a huge document and we have um everybody on the team when they check in and when they start the day when they end the day they they say, this is what I've done so far. So this is the progress I've made so far. I'm like a bullet point. These are the plans I have for tomorrow. Again, bullet point for each person. And then problems, if there are any problems and we need the client to unblock us. And we share that on Slack as well. And that's kind of like this GDoc is kind of like a, like a baton that we pass on to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that we know what other people have done while we've been sleeping. Because, you know, we're obviously in many different time zones. Super useful process, I would say. Um, it can be in GDoc, it can be in something else. We find GDoc quite easy and you can also like comment and, you know, tag ping a, a client. Um, and then we introduce them to the other tools we have. So we might have a uh, mural, we might have, well, usually people know how to choose Google drive. Um, and then when we're prototyping with stuff, we'll introduce them to that as well, little by little, but it's, it's like a constant process. Sometimes we have a mini workshop in the beginning of the sprints where we also show, you know, what we're going to do and make sure that we align our expectations with that, with theirs. Great. I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think it totally so. answers the question. I think, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting to see, you know, the, the client aspect, the client face is something that is very important yeah. to a lot of people working with service. A, as you're speaking, um, I'm going to share a blog post of the PPP so people can understand it better. In the chat? Oh yeah, yeah. that'd be awesome. Thanks for doing this. Um, another question from uh, Bianca it is how to effectively suggest remote collabor collaboration to non-remote companies that I think are great and that I would love to work with. So like companies that you really like that are not remote, not mm -hmm. used to this, but you want to uh, suggest remote collaboration with them. I guess maybe Bianca as a freelancer. Okay. As a freelancer, I think it's a little bit more complicated. I've had this question being asked before, but then again, it depends. I think, I think, for example, if you're having case studies or something to prove that, you know, you've already done this before and it's been successful, um, that's kind of like your mini playbook, you know, it's like you're, you're here, this is what the, when you have so much information about how you would do something and you show, maybe it's, maybe it's just like a PDF or something, you show, this is what I would do, um, this is how it would work, this would be my process with you. When you share a lot of information, people feel like you've got your shit together and this is super helpful, I would say. Um, so maybe as a freelancer, you could do something like that and maybe have a call with them and introduce them to all the tools and, and do something like what we do. Um, otherwise, if you're in a team or in a company already, I would say you could 
start with like a prototype. So you start with like a pilot team and you say, okay, not the whole team, maybe not the whole department, but these three, four people who work together on a project, I mean, it would be make more sense if they actually work together. Let us be a pilot team and test out remote work. But it's not just testing out for a week or a month that is going to give you results. You're, you're going to come across a lot of challenges that you will have to tackle. So I think the important thing is try to make your supervisors understand that remote work, you know, is, is not successful in, in one or three months. Um, I think it took Hanu, I wasn't there at the beginning, but it took them many months to realize how successful it could be. But even today, five years later of being fully remote, there's still room for improvement. And there always will be as you scale, as you change, as, as you try out different tools and processes. So I think it's important to say, let's do the pilot and see how it is. And we learn from it, you know? Totally. Totally agree with that. Um, let's answer another question um, from Barry. How does Hano's collaborative decision making work? Do you have a specific framework for decision making? Yeah, so we have, uh, as I mentioned before in the, in the talk, we have the advisory process. So we were inspired to do this AP process, um, this AP by the book, um, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Deleuze. So I'll just write that in the chat as well. Um, and in that book, um, the author is looking at a lot of, sorry, there you go. Um, a lot of organizations that he calls teal organizations, which are basically self-managed. And he looks at organizations that have over 100 employees up to like 4,000. And these are not digital organizations necessarily. One of them is like a car manufacturing um, company. One is uh, a nursing uh, organization in the, in the Netherlands. And he looks at how these organizations or self-manage themselves on how they make decisions. For example, um, many of them use a proposal system where, well, for example, one, one company will do like, I just I tell people what I'm going to do. Let's say I have a new idea, a new project I want to work on. I'm just going to propose, I'm gonna put it out there and I'm gonna do it anyway, um, but I'm giving people like a time limit of where they can come back to me and say like, I don't fully agree with this. Otherwise I'm gonna go, if there's no objection, I'm gonna go ahead with it. And this is kind of what we have at Hano. It's like, sometimes we come up with things and say, I'm just going to do this. If there's no objection, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And sometimes that's how we did it in the beginning. But then we discovered Lumio. Um, and Lumio is a great online uh, platform where you can actually make proposals and have people vote for them. But as I mentioned before, our voting system is, it's not like we're trying to make like a fully democratic thing. It's not, or, or sorry, it's not like we're trying to reach like a, a consensus that everybody has to agree. It's more like, what is the general vibe here? And then if some people disagree, but it's like the, the minority, we might take that into account and we might have a conversation with them. We will have a conversation with them and see why are you skeptical about this project that I want to do or this, this proposal of mine. And then you can somehow try to discuss with the person some kind of compromise and maybe say, okay, um, I understand why you have um, what, what your fears are, um, I'll take that into consideration. Thank you for making me be aware. I'm going to go ahead and do this and we'll see what the outcomes are of my decision maybe in two months and then we can all come together again and talk about it. So that's how we make decisions. And can you post again this uh, Lumio? I think somebody just posted yeah. it in the chat. Uh, it's Lumio. Lumio dot, dot org. Uh, yeah. I'll just, somebody uh, just posted it. That's good. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks, Ali. Cool. No, no, it's um, not, I, I don't know if it's the same, but actually oh. we use this one, dot org. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. So there is one more question, but it's like we have like one minute left. So okay, I'll be quick. <laughs> this is perhaps not specific to remote work, but how is salary transparency working out in your team? Do you think it's more common in remote teams? Or not? Um, I know, you know, we, we were inspired by Buffer, um, who had a salary uh, transparency. Some kind of, they had like a salary formula or calculator. And in the beginning, this was before I joined Hano, um, salaries were based on several things where you were located. So, you know, if you lived in a city that had a high cost of living versus a city, a place that had a low cost of living, you'd, you'd have like a different value or something that would calculate your salary. Then it was based on your skill, your role, and like how, you know, how, what a kind of an expert you were in that role. Um, and that would, that would work together, put, put together, would give you some kind of salary. But then when I joined, 
again, we were inspired by also um, reinventing organizations and um, other companies where people would, would just choose their own salary and share a proposal with their team and say, based on my expertise and, and my lifestyle and, and what I feel I need in my life, this is the kind of salary I think I should need. And then you share that and then the people in the team would either say, well, you're underestimating yourself or I don't think you should go that low or um, yeah, we agree with it or it's too high. Um, and then you'd have a discussion again. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like it's been really helpful for us and we still have people who make salary proposals when they want like a salary raise. Um, and yeah, we, we, I think it's knowing how much other people earn is just great. I mean, I, I worked in, or in a company before where I found out like two years later that somebody who was doing basically the same thing as me was earning more. And when I found out, you know, I was pretty disappointed. Mm. Um, so I think, I think just being very transparent about that just avoids so many disappointments and maybe uh, feelings of like envy or anything like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's mm. interesting. Um, I think many people are talking about this in remote work a lot. Mm. Um, so we're done. Unfortunately, there's thank no you. more time. And I really had to wrap up because I have to go right. to Libby. Okay. Um, thank you so much again for being here today. And I uh, hope you had a, a great time like we all did. Thank you for having me. It's been great. And I'm going to read all the comments later. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. All right. Bye. Bye.